Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Tech Tune-Up Solutions for High-Performance Trust Accounting. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Florida Bar Standing Committee on Technology and Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar. This is a continuation of our series of webinars, which we will be hosting with the Standing Committee on Technology leading up to our annual All-Day Technology Seminar, which is taking place in conjunction with the annual Florida Bar Convention on June 9th. The details of these upcoming webinars and the All-Day Technology Seminar will be posted on LegalFuel.com, so please be sure to visit LegalFuel for those updates. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature, which you'll find out at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do their best to answer any questions you have. However, due to time constraints, we may not be able to address them all. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit, including one hour of technology and one hour of ethics. The course number for today is 4739. Again, that course number for today is 4739. And I'd now like to hand it over to Ms. Janelle Weber. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it. I know Gavin and I are both very excited to be presenting on trust accounting today. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I've been an attorney in Florida now for about 16 years. I'm also admitted in New York. And for the bulk of my career, um, it's, it was spent at an AMLAW 200 law firm in Tampa, and I was a commercial litigation partner there. After about 10 years, I decided to start my own firm, which I named Manta Law, and I practice in, in the area of litigation, focusing on small business disputes, as well as representing consumers in debt collection harassment cases, debt defense, and garnishment defense. I also handle civil appeals and defamation and invasion of privacy. Since I opened my own firm, I've been wearing a lot of different hats. I do all my own bookkeeping and trust accounting, and that has been a learning process, which I've been continuing to learn in preparation for this webinar. So throughout this webinar, I'll be primarily focusing a lot on the, the Florida Bar rules and some best practices. And Gavin will be talking a lot about our technology solutions and how we can improve efficiency and make sure that we're complying with the rules by using some of the tools that are available to us. Um, one fun fact about myself is that our other family business is owning a car dealership in the Tampa Bay area and we uh, specialize in exotic cars and other um, buying pre-owned cars. So that helped inspire the theme of our presentation today, the tune-up. I think it's a good analogy and I'll explain why in just a little bit, but now I'm gonna hand this off to Gavin for his introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gavin Musinski, uh, really happy to be here. Um, I am the head of sales at NOTA by M&T Bank. Uh, I've got 10 years uh, of uh, financial service experience. Uh, I've been with M&T my entire career, right out of uh, undergrad. Uh, M&T Bank, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, we're a top 20 bank in the US, primarily located in the Northeast. Uh, I'm actually sitting in sunny Buffalo, New York. Uh, and you might've heard of us if you're an NFL fan because our name is on the stadium where the Baltimore Ravens play. Uh, but I've spent the last two years uh, working uh, on a special team at the bank called the NOTA team. And we've been working directly with lawyers, particularly solo and small firm lawyers, to really give them a, a personalized, customized digital banking experience. And we're very excited to start getting more and more involved in Florida uh, because we uh, see a tremendous amount of opportunity down there. And uh, certainly you guys have, have a lot of attorneys in your market as well. So uh, really happy to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, discussing some some fun trust accounting facts with, uh, with all of you. All right, so in this screen, I have a roadmap of what we're gonna be discussing today. And I mentioned that um, the theme of our presentation is the tune-up. So I think it's a good analogy because 
as a car owner, you want to make sure that your car is running efficiently. And if there's any problems that hopefully you find those out before you have, you know, a problem on the road and you have to call AAA. So one part of, you know, being a responsible car owner is to get your vehicle inspected. Um, they say to do it about twice a year. And also, you, of course, you want to do a tune-up, right? You want to make sure that everything is performing properly and that if anything needs to be replaced, you do it in a timely fashion. So, so too with trust accounting. I think that today is a good opportunity for us to go through an inspection and diagnostic test of our trust accounting practices and procedures so that we can make sure that we are doing things correctly and that we can also find out what we can do to improve our practices. So first, we're gonna start off with a brief introduction to remind us about the basic rules of trust accounting and just some of the, the basic principles. I'm not gonna go into every single rule of trust accounting today, um, but of course you can consult the rules of professional conduct if you need some more detail. Then, the inspection and diagnostics portion with our checklist of the top things we need to evaluate for ourselves. Then we'll have the tune-up section. This is gonna be some solutions to increase our efficiency and ensure compliance. We will be mentioning some specific products today, but we are not giving any endorsements and we cannot go through every option because there are just too many out there. And um, we're not in a position of being able to give you a consumer reports, but we will mention a couple and give you some tips if you're looking for a new product or new solution. And finally, we'll have some closing thoughts and questions. Our next slide shows the basic timeline of our trust account accounting obligations. And of course that starts out with opening a trust account. And there are some letters that we'll talk about in more detail that you need to complete and give to your bank. I would assume that most of us here today do have a trust account. However, it's not always the case that we've remembered to to do one of those forms that needs to be on our letterhead. So I'll discuss that more. And then we have some monthly obligations and that includes performing client ledger reports and three-way reconciliations and saving those. One of our annual obligations is to perform a report and that is a detailed report of the clients and what they have in their trust account. That of course also needs to be saved. And then our final annual obligation is to certify compliance with the Florida Bar that we have filed the trust accounting rules. And you do that certification when you pay your Florida Bar dues. Of course, if you haven't, um, if you haven't, you know, followed all the rules, then you have an opportunity then to inform the Florida Bar of that how long we have to keep our trust accounting documents, six years. And there's also some other rules if you are to close a trust account, if you're to um, close your practice. We're not gonna get into those details today. So here are the, a visual of the three principles of trust accounting. First is the fiduciary responsibility. As attorneys, of course, we're preserving the trust account funds or property for the persons that it belongs to. And we can't get any personal benefit out of that. So we can't earn interest on our clients' trust funds. And we also have to keep those trust funds for the specific purpose that they were given to us for. So if they are to advance costs, then it has to be for that purpose. And you can't be switching it over for, for some other need um, that you have, even if it's related to that client's matter without their permission, of course. And the next principle is no commingling. Of course, we need to keep the trust account 
funds separate from our own attorney's fees um, and other funds of our firm that are operating funds. And of course, that's why we have a separate trust fund, trust account. We'll get into the different kinds of trust accounts in just a little bit. But of course, you have to remember not to commingle. And part of that is um, when you're earning a flat fee, you do have to keep in mind that if there are any costs that are part of that flat fee, those estimated costs, those amounts do need to be put into the trust account. And the third principle is that the lawyer is always responsible. The lawyer can delegate tasks to another person to handle to maintain the trust account, but their law license, you know, they may or may not have a law license. And of course, the buck stops with the lawyer. And if there's an audit, um, they're going to go to the lawyer and the lawyer is going to be responsible. So even though you might hand some things off, you do need to um, remain as an overseer role and really looking closely to make sure that things are being done properly. I did want to touch briefly on disciplinary issues. We're not going to be getting into detail about um, tales of woe where someone didn't follow the rules and what kind of discipline they got, but it is important to keep in mind that um, trust accounting issues do take up a fairly you know, sizable percentage of the Florida Bar's disciplinary issues in any given year. And in 2017 and 2018, and then 18 to 19, over 17% of the discipline cases of the bar were related to trust account issues. This slide highlights that there are two kinds of trust accounts. There's the IOTA and the non-IOTA. And the IOTA account is for short-term and nominal funds. So if you do receive some funds um, in that are to pay attorney's fees, presumably that would be uh, for a short-term period. And those funds would be put in your IOTA account that is earning interest for uh, the Florida Bar Foundation. Non-IOTA, that is when you have you know, funds that are not considered nominal or therefore a longer period of time. And there the client himself or herself can be earning interest on those funds and those would not be placed in the IOTA account. So now we're going to be going into our inspection and diagnostic test um, section. But before we do that, I would like to ask Gavin. Um, so as part of in your role for NODA, you interact with a lot of different attorneys. Before we get into this checklist of things to think about, can you tell us what's, what's top of mind for the attorneys that you interact with, what are some of their primary concerns when it comes to trust accounting? Yeah, I, I, I think it goes, uh, I don't even have to really think about it because it is top, the, the top concern across the board. Uh, it's exactly what you touched on on the prior slide, right? Nobody wants to get in trouble. And it's uh, unique with attorneys. You guys are in this profession where uh, if you mismanage client funds, um, you face disciplinary action, suspension, disbarment, you know, that there, there's bad things that can happen. So across the board, I'd say the biggest concern is nobody wants to be audited. No one wants to face the grievance committee and, and get into any, any trouble there. Now, uh, even though that's their biggest concern, we do hear, you know, th there's challenges. And, and one quote that, that we've actually heard dozens and dozens of times, you know, when you talk to particularly um, solo and, and small firm attorneys. I say, you know, I went to law school to be a lawyer, not an accountant. And there's all these strict requirements that I need to follow. And I'm not at a big firm where you have uh, a dedicated accounting division that's doing all this stuff. A, a lot of times it's the attorneys that are wearing multiple hats. So uh, because it's a pain point, we see that it often gets uh, put off. 
It's not typically the top thing on their to-do list. Uh, and sometimes that process is, is clunky. You know, it's not streamlined. So you might have some attorneys, if you're really old school, doing it pen and paper or with a spreadsheet or using multiple systems, whether it's, you know, your accounting, your practice management or, or any ancillary programs there. And any opportunity where there's, uh, you know, manual entry. So again, spreadsheets, physical ledgers, we often see that there, there, there's potential for, for human error. So, um, you know, those are just a few of the high level things that, that we hear. And uh, unfortunately, it's something we hear uh, more, more times than not. And when you've heard from attorneys who have implemented a new technology solution, do you generally get the sense that it's taken some of the pressure off them? What's their general impression after they've um, taken a step forward in the technology realm? Yeah, I think a step forward is always a good thing. Um, but it, honestly, it depends on their process. I, I think if we were to ask uh, five attorneys at random on this call, we'd probably hear five different processes. Um, I would say that for folks that are going from a, a manual process to a, to a digital process, you know, it's, it's probably going to be well received and, and it's going to show some improvement there. But it can also be overwhelming, right? So we, we've talked to, again, these smaller firms that they might have implemented um, a robust solution with a lot of bells and whistles and it's, it's you know, the Cadillac of, of how you manage it, but they might only be using a small fraction of that solution. So uh, ultimately the biggest question we, we like to make sure is just, you know, how are you using it? What are you using it for? And, and really are you getting the support you need? Because technology is great and it can be very helpful and it can help eliminate, again, the room for human error. But it's also nice to have that human touch. And if you have questions, if you are overwhelmed, you want to make sure that that, that technology offering has a support team and, and you know, support offerings that, that are fitting for, because uh, mo most attorneys are not super tech savvy. And, and I'm guilty as not being very tech savvy myself. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I know a decent amount, but I'm by no means a, a Google developer. Uh, when I have a question, I kind of like calling and talking to someone and, and we encourage the same thing. Okay. All right, so next we're gonna talk about making sure that your trust account is set up correctly. Hopefully you're working with a bank who is familiar with um, trust accounting rules and are gonna have the proper forms for you to fill out or to remind you about those. But those forms are also all available on the Legal Fuel website, which is really a great resource. So, of course, your trust account does need to have the trust account words in the title. And when you're printing when you're printing checks, it should also say trust account. You want to make sure that your account is properly handling the bank and credit card fees. So the best thing would be for if there are any fees associated with the trust account, those ideally would be taken directly from the operating account. And that should be a very simple thing for the bank to do. Because we don't want to have to worry about having you know, sufficient attorney funds in the trust account in order to cover those fees because we never really know how much they're gonna be, especially when it comes to credit card fees because those can be substantial. So um, some, Florida Bar approved vendors, I believe LawPay is one, and that is one of the um, programs that I do use for my credit card fees. They're automatically going to be taking out those fees from the operating account, and that saves you a lot of trouble. The minimum attorney amount in the trust account. Yes, you are permitted to have a certain amount in there. Um, it can be 100. I've also heard banks say that 200 is pretty common, but it has to be a, sm a small amount. You can't put in a larger amount in order to pad the trust account um, to prevent yourself from overdrafting. That is certainly uh, not permitted and will get you into trouble if, if that is found to be the case and no overdraft protection. One thing to think about when you're setting up a, a new account is you can ask about mobile deposits into the trust account. Um, with my bank, it wasn't automatically set up to 
take pictures of checks and to deposit those into the trust account, it was set up for the operating account, but I did ask about it and they said it was available. And also some banks do offer, um, of course they offer bill pay, online bill pay for your operating account. It's also something you could consider for the trust account, but uh, some banks may not want to, to do that because of all the trust accounting rules. So it's something you could think about. Um, and there's other options for check printing as we'll discuss. The next slide, we need to make sure that we've completed the proper, the proper forms to open up our trust account. There's a notice to eligible institution form that's for the bank. And there's a sample trust account bank notification letter. Um, well, this sample is available on the Legal Fuel website and it needs to be put on your letterhead, signed and dated. And it says that if you ever do overdraw the trust account, the bank needs to report you to the Florida bar and it has some contact information there. And then there's this notice to the bar foundation. And um, as I recall, this is one that the bank submits directly to the bar foundation to alert them to your trust account. Another requirement is to complete a trust account plan, and there's a sample plan on the Legal Fuel website. This is a requirement for any firm that has two or more attorneys. However, it is a good idea to write a trust plan, even if you're a solo practitioner, and you can find an example on Legal Fuel. The, the trust plan is a good idea because um, it can give you some accountability for yourself and your firm about when certain things need to be done and by whom, who's authorized to do all these different things. Uh, when you have a bigger firm, clearly you have people in a lot of different roles. There may be someone who is doing transfers. There's someone who's doing three point, um, the three part re reconciliations and um, maybe someone who's responsible for making sure that the the bank account records are all saved and put in the proper place. So you wanna lay out everyone's responsibilities. And for a solo, you may want to write down um, the deadlines that you're gonna give yourself for, for all of these things. Uh, for example, you may want to do the, the reconciliations on a monthly basis before you send out your bills. You want to send out your bills clearly, you wanna get paid, um, but you, you can't forget that you have this monthly obligation to do these reports. So you can put that on your calendar and try and hold yourself accountable that way. We do have certain minimum trust accounting records that have to be retained each month by the Florida Bar. Of course, your bank account records, the, the banks are all offering those as PDFs now that you can download. So it's good to get into habit of doing those and putting those in a file and keeping those. You do need to keep copies of the checks and, and you need to keep both the front and the back copies of the checks. Now, some of the monthly statements they may just include front copies of the checks, but the backs could be available in another location. For example, uh, with my bank, when I go onto the online banking and I click on those deposited checks and I do a couple of clicks, I can get a copy of the back as well. And so I take a screen capture and I save all of those in a file um, in an orderly way. But however your bank does it, make sure that you're getting both the front and the back because it's required. Your checks need to be numbered consecutively and they have to include all endorsements and all of their data and tracking information. And the checks need to clearly identify the case um, or the case you know, by name or number in the memo area of the check. So make sure that that's there. Some other requirements for the monthly um, 
preservation of your records is to keep a record of all the transfers and disbursements into and out of the trust account. If you're using a practice management solution, uh, there are places where you can enter all of this information. You can enter the, the person, the name of the person authorizing the transfer, the name of the recipient. You're also required to keep confirmation of the transfer. Some banks will give you a, a confirmation number for internal transfers between the trust account and the operating account. It's a good idea to keep those if they offer them. Um, but also just the fact that transfer did take place, that should constitute confirmation as well, and that will appear on the monthly bank statement. You also need to keep a record of the date and time that the transfer was completed. Gavin, can you give us some best practices about record retention when it comes to everything that we need to save. Can you give us some thoughts on, on that? Yeah, for, for record retention, um, I think certainly you wanna make sure every, every state is different, right? So with Florida, I know you mentioned uh, six years. So it's really important that you're, uh, you know, <laughs> you're at least doing that. And in that records, you should be keeping everything you just mentioned, right? So uh, money movement by client, evidence of the overall account being reconciled, um, and, and we've seen a couple different best practices, you know, a lot of people, it's kind of a mixed bag when it comes to saving things to the cloud, you know, some people like it and they say, hey, it's efficient, I could do it from anywhere and it, it, it you know, it's, it's very easy. Uh, some people are a little more conservative and say, hey, I don't trust it, I want to be keeping hard copies and, and you know, unless I can hold it, uh, I, don't, I don't feel good about it. Uh, if you are using the, uh, the cloud, and uh, if you can hear my dog barking, <laughs> I, I apologize, the mailman just knocked on the door. If you are using the cloud, um, best practices, number one, make sure that it's a well-respected vendor uh, that can be trusted, right? So uh, Clio, uh, some of the established practice management softwares, your bank, um, make sure you understand uh, the credibility there. Uh, if you are gonna be having something that you access with a password, this might sound like a no brainer, but use a strong password, right? We shouldn't be using something that's generic if it's gonna have access to something as important as our, our trust accounting and be mindful of phishing attempts. So it can be really easy to get fooled by emails where you're getting contacted and it looks like it's legitimate, uh, but maybe the link is a little off or the spelling's a little off. So uh, attorneys are particularly vulnerable because the balances that you all keep in the trust accounts. Um, so be mindful of that. Uh, and, and when possible, uh, try to have two-factor authentication. So if you're saving stuff in the cloud, uh, make sure you have uh, you know second way to verify whether it's a text alert or the thumb thumb uh, verification through your phone, whatever that looks like. But I would recommend uh, try to save things on the cloud when possible. And and as a good backup, you can always save it as a PDF, um, as you mentioned, uh, Janelle, on your uh, your personal hard drive. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to go through some overarching questions that you should be asking yourself, is complying with the Florida Bar rules for trust accounting, is it taking you too long? And if so, why? And is there anything that you can do to speed up the process? Are you faithfully performing your reconciliations and retaining the records? And if you're not, what can you do to make sure that you and your firm are doing that regularly? Do you have the right person handling each task? And are you implementing proper oversight over those individuals? And if you had a person um, handling the trust account and they did leave, would you be able to you know, pick up the ball and run with it? Would you be able to respond to that audit and follow the correct procedure? And additionally, what parts of all of this can be automated? So, Part of that, we're gonna be talking about that in our next section, which is our technology solutions. So first we wanted to discuss using a legal practice management solution or trust accounting software. There are various options out there, so many that we can't 
mentioned, but there is a distinction between um, solutions that are not specifically oriented towards attorneys and those that are. So Gavin, could you tell us um, a little bit about generic accounting programs and how they may differ from one that's focused um, more towards attorneys? Yeah, and, and I think you said the magic word, right? The, the biggest difference is that uh, generic accounting programs are exactly that, they're, they're generic. So uh, they're probably great for doing a, uh, you know, a, a profit and loss statement or a balance sheet, but these are probably the same tools being used by you know, ice cream shops and, and pet stores. So they typically don't have lawyer specific functionality. Uh, and oftentimes they're, they're quite popular, you can still use them, but it probably takes a little bit of tweaking by the attorney so that it can, it can be fit for purpose. So things to look for, you know, regardless of, of what your accounting tools are, you know, number one, right, with the trust account, do you have that reconciliation functionality? Um, can you look uh, not only at the overall account, but do you have visibility matter by matter, right? We know the rules not only say we have to be reconciled down to the penny, but you as the attorney are supposed to understand um, all money movement in or out by client, uh, the date, the details, and purpose for all of those transactions. So if you are using a generic tool, just make sure that if that's not something that's standard, how are you fitting it so that you can do that um, without minimal, minimal effort on, on your end? And really at, at a minimum, regardless of the tool, you wanna make sure there's controls in place from commingling funds so what are the protections? What are the guardrails? Human error happens. We're all very busy. You're doing a million different things. You know, you, you fat finger a number or you, you assign something to the wrong, the wrong case. What are the controls that, that keep you uh, from, from making those mistakes? And does this tool, does this accounting tool integrate with your current uh, tech stack? So whether you're talking your, your bank, whether you're talking your practice management software, you do not want to be doing double work in multiple systems. And, and I, I, not to go too much off topic, but I've, I've literally spoken with attorneys that when you ask about their process, they say, yep, I've got it all buttoned up. I've got a spreadsheet and I track everything there. I've also got, you know, Clio or a practice management software and I track stuff there. And I do QuickBooks at the end of the month and I track stuff there. And I promise you they're not making mistakes because they're doing it three different times. So they're going to catch it. But is that the optimal setup if you're doing things three different times in three different systems, right? You need to ask yourself from an efficiency standpoint, uh, what's the trade-off between you know efficiency and, and and peace of mind there? And and really, you know, I, I know Janelle, you mentioned this in the beginning of the call. You know, too many tools to, to name, nothing that that's formally endorsed, but you know, practice management software, there's a lot out there. Accounting software, there's more than just you know QuickBooks. There's zero. I believe TrustBooks is is, is uh, something uh, pretty popular in Florida. A um, lot, a lot of things out there. Just make sure that you know at the end of the day, you're fitting it to meet your meet your needs uh, as an attorney. Okay. And some of these bullet points up here on this screen, your legal practice management solutions should be able to give you this functionality. They should have client ledgers where you can see the the trust account balance for each of your clients, the in and the out. And like you said, what the purpose of those funds is for. And they should also have um, a protection so that you aren't overdrawing your client's trust funds so that you can see exactly how much is left. And if you try and um, put more funds from the trust account to pay a legal invoice than you have for that client, it's automatically going to alert you and to stop you from doing that. Um, if you're paying attention to the software. They also, a lot of them give you the option of including your trust balance on the invoice. And that is something that the Florida Bar wants to see. They, they want your clients to be able to see, you know, how much is left in their trust account. And some of these programs also give you a dashboard view where you can see everything that's going on in a matter at a particular time, how many hours and fees are into it, how much is in the trust account if the trust funds are below uh, the designated amount that you've selected for that matter. So our next slide is about uh, the concept of syncing and integrating solutions. And Gavin, you touched on this 
a little bit before. Um, but for those of us who have maybe not integrated everything, and maybe that causes a little bit of stress, um, can you elaborate more on, on what syncing and integrating is all about? And even if you want to give some examples from NODA's perspective too. Um, yeah, with, with syncing, you know, and integrating, the word integration is, is thrown around a lot. And it's just important that you understand what that means, because it can mean different things, right? Is it, is it real-time data transferring from, from one tool to another? Uh, is, it, is it something that integrates only if you manually import? Um, or does it do perhaps batch updates, right? Where at the end of the night, maybe 2 a.m., information is feeding from, from one system to another. Uh, easy question is just to, to ask whatever tool you're using, whoever you're working with, you know, how that integration works. And I would say automation is powerful and it reduces that data entry component, but you need to test. So before you go live, before you connect, for example, your bank account to your accounting software, you know, it might make sense to test it. So you're not playing a massive uh, cleanup effort and, and unwinding a, a massive, uh, you know, knot of, uh, of confusion. And at the end of the day, you know, integrations and, and using tools to work smarter, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but your bank account is what matters. And if you're audited, they're not going to be saying, show us your spreadsheets or show us your, your PMS. That's all supplemental. You want to make sure that the information that's in your bank account is accurately uh, representative of, of the data you have from, from your other tools. And uh, one little thing I would mention is that when I was doing my taxes, um, for this last year, I did notice that there was a period of, of time where the um, my bank account wasn't synced up, you know, correctly with QuickBooks. So there was some, you know, information that wasn't uh, being fed into QuickBooks, and you may not, you know, catch that unless you're, you know, double checking. So syncing is not always foolproof. So you gotta keep your eye on that. So our next slide is about three-way reconciliation. This can get a little bit confusing, um, but it is our obligation to do it every month. So Gavin's going to tell us what it is, and then we are going to talk about uh, how technology can assist us with this process. Yeah, so three-way reconciliation uh... It's, it's, I promise it's not that complex, right? As the title uh, dictates, there's, there's three components. You've got the, the bank balance, you've got the client ledger balance, and you've got the trust accounting book balance. The bank balance, you know, point number one here, uh, very straightforward, right? That's what you're getting from your bank statement. And that's, uh, that's showing you, uh, really it's a snapshot. So it's showing you a snapshot at the end of the month of all transactions, but the nuance is it doesn't show any pending transactions. It's only gonna show stuff that has cleared the bank account, stuff that's actually hit. That's what you're getting on, on the bank side. You also are keeping track on point number two, your, your client ledger balance. So we touched on this a little bit before. It is your responsibility as the attorney to be keeping track of all incoming and outgoing transactions by client with again, date, transaction details and purpose. You need to understand the purpose of those transactions. So. A lot of people are using uh, technology uh, uh, for that. And we're gonna show you in a minute uh, an example of, of one tool that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with. And then number three is the, the trust accounting book balance. Now, this can be from QuickBooks, TrustBooks, your accounting software. The big difference between this and, and point number one, the trust accounting uh, the, is showing you pending transactions. So if you are logging a check or you're printing a check and you hand it to a client and they walk away, that needs to be captured somewhere, but it's not going to be reflected in your bank until that check clears. So the important thing is that you're comparing your bank statement with down to the penny funds by client, as well as your accounting information that shows any transactions that are that are in transit or, uh, or float. Okay. And the Florida Bar does provide example spreadsheets that are available on the Legal Field website. Um, they're in Excel where you can manually enter in um, all of your, your bank account balances and any of the, the checks that haven't cleared and all of your um, the clients and the totals of their trust balances. But there are tools that can help us 
make this a quicker and more streamlined function. So Gavin is going to talk to us about one, and then I will mention another option for you. And before we get into the example um, slides, here's some things to keep in mind. Gavin, do you want to just talk about this as an intro to the next slides? Yeah. So, th so the next slides. This is this is this is why I'm excited to be here. I I'm very passionate about uh, you know sharing my screen and, and showing you what, uh, or I'm sorry, sharing the slides that that uh, Jeanette has here, but. Uh, Trustnota.com is, uh, is, is what we've built um, by working directly with attorneys. And essentially what we do is that three-way reconciliation and, and, and that process we've streamlined. So it's all automated using real bank data. But again, regardless of the tool you use, um, and I'm gonna show you one example and, and Janelle will show you another. The important thing is when you're looking at technology, you have easy visibility of those IOTA funds you want to make sure again, because we know float is important. So whether you're doing it through a QuickBooks, a Trustbooks, a Clio, however you're tracking it, those pending transactions that have not cleared, you need to make sure that you have access to that visibility. Easy access for monitoring, right? This, excuse me, should not be, should not be complicated. And you want to make sure you have digital options. So one thing that we've heard, um, and, and this is more on the banking side, but it ties directly to, to again, that, that trust account. Do you have digital access to it? Can you do a mobile check deposit? Do you need to physically go to a branch to, to figure out what, what's going on there? It's really important that, you know, when you're accessing these accounts, you don't have to get up, you don't have to move. You wanna be able to do it as, as you're working as a busy attorney. So uh, making sure that you have digital options that, uh, that streamline. And, and what I'm gonna talk about in the following couple of slides is just one, one option that's out there. So one of the things that we heard, um, and this, this for those of you, uh, you know, again, that, that are seeing this for the first time, this is an example of, of a dashboard that we offer through, uh, through NOTA by m and Bank. And again, that website, it's trustnota.com. And, and this is something that we've built because as we kind of touched on in the beginning, we heard from attorneys, the IOTA is sacred. I cannot mess it up. I could lose my license. I'm losing sleep over this. But when you look at, at your typical trust account, it looks no different than your personal checking account, right? You get your monthly statement that shows starting balance, ending balance, and money movement in or out, but it doesn't help you with all the requirements you need as an attorney. Who does the money belong to? What is the purpose of that transaction? Anytime money moves in or out, we know it's related to a client matter. So what we did was we actually met over the past uh, two years, we've worked directly with practicing attorneys uh, to build what, what you see here. And this is an example of what your dashboard would look like. This is not a practice management software. This is not an accounting tool. Think of this as a smarter bank account. This is your banking experience uh, with the IOTA account. And if you look at the top here, you see a section for untagged transactions. You'll notice next to checks, there's check images front and back. You'll notice we see uh, the type of transaction, whether it's a debit or credit. But on the right side, you'll notice that there's an option to, for, for client matters. And what NOTA allows you to do, because we understand that again, anytime money moves in or out, it needs to be categorized and assigned to a specific client matter. We give attorneys the ability to click a button and automatically assign those funds to virtual client matters, which you can see on the bottom of the screen here is an example, Andy Apples, Billy Bottles, Candace Candy, our fake uh, client names here. You can create these virtual sub accounts with a click of a button. Now, again, regardless of where you bank, that's another question to maybe ask, right? If you have an IOTA account, how can I get sub accounts? Is there sub accounting functionality available through my bank? A lot of banks offer it. It might be an add-on, you might have to ask, but again, we know the importance for IOTAs is keeping track of funds by client. And this type of bucketing or sub accounting is a really easy way to get that type of uh, clean visibil visibility without having to run uh, complex reports. Are you ready for the next screen? I am. Okay. So this would show you as an example, if you were to double click on one of those sub accounts. So with this case, we've got the Gavin Patrick real estate matter. And what you'll notice is that this is going to show you a complete financial history of all money movement in or out of the account. Now, a couple of things I want to highlight here as to how, how this is different than, than typical bank accounts. Um, 
Most banks probably have a couple months of, of statements. And if you ever need to access them uh, beyond that, you're, you're calling a help number or 1-800 number or, or your personal banker. We've heard about the importance of, of a digital paper trail. And we know that you know, with Florida, it's, um, it's six years. The ABA says you need a five-year paper trail. New York State is actually seven years. Uh, we actually built this so that this entire process is a fully digital paper trail for a seven-year period. So in addition to showing you any transaction in or out by client, you'll notice on the right, there's a notes field where you as the attorney have the ability to put notes explaining the purpose of that transaction. And that's a feature we built, again, directly based off of attorney feedback, because what we heard was with all the different moving pieces and how busy everyone is, it's really easy for certain things to get lost in the shuffle. With Nota, you can simply document the purpose of that transaction and both the transaction and that custom note are saved digitally for that seven year period. Now, what I also wanna highlight on this slide, you'll notice on the bottom, we've got matter transactions, right? You'll see those April 25th, February 1st, April 26th. Those are transactions that actually hit the account. But you'll also notice above that, there's a section for outstanding checks. What we heard from users, right, that were using just generic IOTA accounts, they said, hey, I don't know when a check clears until it clears. I wish there was a way for me to keep track of that float and then have a, a real true indication of what's available in that sub account. You'll notice here, you have the ability to do that. You can print checks directly through Nota. So we will give you check stock. You can print it right on your home printer. And the benefit of doing that is number one, you know, you're not, you're not manually handwriting anything, but number two, we're gonna track that float. So even though this example here, you see check number 103 uh, for court fees from a May 5th appearance for $150 has not cleared yet. That might be sitting in someone's mailbox or buried on a desk somewhere, but we know it's outstanding. And as an attorney, we need to, we need to track that. So we will track that as float. And when you look at the top right, you see the matter adjusted balance. That shows you the adjusted balance that takes into account that float. So really the goal here and, and kind of what we heard from lawyers, I want to understand the purpose of every single transaction. I want a, a paper trail and digital history to show me uh, if I'm ever audited, I have peace of mind that I can, I can pull that up. And I want to understand the moving pieces. I want to be able to track that float and know what's really available in my account. So these are all the functionalities we built in to show um, on the client matter level. Now tell us about how NOTA can help with the three-way reconciliation. So the, the, the best I can do is just show how, how, how clean this, this slide is. Um, this is only the top half of the report. I couldn't fit the whole thing on the screen, so, so I apologize. But really, we do this with, with the click of a button. So what the process is today when you talk to attorneys, pretty much regardless of, of, of what your tools are, if I was a betting man, I would say you're probably documenting your transaction somewhere, QuickBooks, TrustBooks, accounting software, practice management, you're documenting something here and you're comparing it to your bank statement. And if you're doing it appropriately and responsibly, you're doing that on a monthly basis. But as a prerequisite, you need to wait for that statement to drop. You're playing the matching game and trying to see, okay, what's outstanding, what hasn't cleared. Because with Noda, you're documenting with real bank data directly within the source of truth you don't need to wait for the bank statement. You know at any given time what's outstanding and what's not and what transactions have hit. So you can run this report. You'll notice the reconciliation report is as of March 11th. It's a static point in time. It's not the end of the month. Our users can do this weekly. They can do it after each closing. They can do it however frequently they want. And with a click of a button, you'll notice in the top right, we will alert you if you're reconciled or not. And we will take all the thinking out of it. So you would see the book balance, the adjusted trust balance and the client ledger balance. And if you're correctly assigned all those funds to the correct, to the correct sub accounts, you'll see right here, everything is balanced and you're good to go. You can print this, you can save this for your personal records. Um, but at the end of the day, we wanted to make this as easy as possible for attorneys. So they could simply click a button, focus on practicing law and have peace of mind that everything's balanced and that they're tracking their funds appropriately. Okay. and. One of the requirements of the Florida Bar is that your trust account be maintained in a bank that has an office in Florida unless you have client consent. Otherwise, can you elaborate on how M&T complies with that obligation? 
Yes, I love that. So we that, that is that is not just true for Florida. That is true uh, every state that we operate, and I believe um, nationwide. As an attorney, you can only open up a trust account if the bank is domiciled, um, you know where where you operate. We have a, a sole office. We're proud to say one, hopefully the first of many, um, in Florida, where um, we're allowed to uh, leverage that uh, being our presence in the footprint to open up accounts. Now, what I can say for folks that are in Florida that are using Noda, and we've got about a dozen or so out of our, uh, our 500 users uh, today, um, this is stuff that we do all digitally. So you're not going into the branch. You're doing DocuSign to open the accounts. You're getting everything sent to you digitally. There's no in-person interaction. It's just this, it's the video conference call, but we are able to support um, Florida and open up IOTAs in the state of Florida based on our, our sole office um, that we have uh, in the Florida market. Okay, and the other program that I want to talk to you about today is Trust Books, which is a vendor that has been vetted and approved by the Florida Bar. And it can be used as a supplement to a generic accounting program such as QuickBooks. You can either opt in just to do the trust accounting function or you can pay extra if you want to re replace your other accounting software but it also gives you a three-way reconciliation report function um, that is simple, you know, with a couple of clicks of the button and will save you the hassle of doing those Excel spreadsheets as long as you're, you know, entering everything in as you should be. And a trust books can also integrate with a number of different practice management uh, solutions, including Clio, which I use. It, um, if you'd like to learn more about trust books, you can go on the Florida Bar website and go to um, practice or member benefits under financial services. And it's listed with a link there and some of the discounts that they are currently offering to Florida Bar members. <laughs> Just some final thoughts on our presentation today. I'll start off. I've found that, you know, as a, as a newly solo for the last um, few years attorney, it can be very intimidating at first to do the regular um, monthly reconciliations, but it's something that you can pick up quickly if you just delve into it make sure that you're faithfully doing it and employ some of the technology that's available. If you don't yet have some have a solution such as Nota or Trustbooks, hopefully you do have a resource where you can perform client ledger reports. And that will show you um, how much is in each client's trust balance and the ins and the outs for that particular month. And it'll give you uh, what the ending balance of the trust account should theoretically be. Um, and then you compare that to your bank statements. And when you do have the discrepancies, that's when you can use a tool such as an Excel spreadsheet um, to list in those checks that haven't cleared or those deposits that haven't actually appeared in the account yet. So if you're not ready to sign on for another program, um, there are more than enough tools out there to show you exactly how to do it step-by-step, -step. resources available on um, the Florida Bar website and other various YouTube videos to walk you through the process. And we look forward to giving this presentation again um, next month for the Technology Symposium. So Gavin, can you tell us some final thoughts? No, I, I, I appreciate the time and, and being invited here to, to participate. This is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, Noda started as an idea on a post-it note. It literally was an attorney in Maryland that was a sole practitioner that said, hey, I'm losing sleep, I, I can't do this. And, and we decided to build something. And not only did we build something, but it, it was built with attorneys for attorneys. So. I'm hopeful that um, people at least learn something today. I'm hopeful that you, you've learned about a couple different options. 
Um, I do uh, see a question that came uh, to, to uh, in the chat. There is no charge for NOTA. Um, it's, it's completely complimentary. It might not be for everybody. So please look at it and look at the requirements, um, but would be happy to, uh, to talk with anybody offline if they want to learn more. We've got a 20 person support team and, and ultimately the goal is to make this as easy as possible. And, and Janelle, you mentioned when you started off, it was intimidating, uh, but you kind of got the hang of it and you're feeling better. We don't want this to be intimidating for anybody. We want you to be focusing on practicing law so we can help you with, uh, with the banking and with the trust accounting. So really appreciate the time and, and thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Gavin. Do you see any other questions, Gavin? I know you had that up on your screen. Um, a, a couple of the questions that came through, you, you can get the answers to on, on the NOTA website, which you'll see right here. Um, one question was about um, scanners for check deposits, given our, our limited branch uh, network in Florida. Um, right now, we start, depending on, on your volume, uh, we do higher mobile check deposit limits. So we do a 50,000 daily, 100,000 monthly uh, limit. So you don't need to go to a branch. You can do it all with the phone. If your transaction volume or your check volume uh, exceeds that, uh, we can get you set up with a, uh, a scanner um, to, uh, to process those checks from your office, especially considering, again, there's not, a, not an M&T bank on every corner down there in, uh, in Florida. Okay, well, thank you for that. So we really appreciate everybody coming out and you can contact Gavin and I, we have our uh, email addresses and phone numbers there. And we look forward to offering this again uh, next month at the Technology Symposium. So good luck everybody. And I think Jonathan will come on once more. If you didn't write down the code, we're gonna tell you what that was once more. Yes, uh, thank you, Janelle and Gavin. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, again, everybody, today's uh, course number is gonna be 4739, and that's 4739. And you can post that for one hour of general CLE credit, including one hour of ethics and one hour of technology. And if you'd like to rewatch today's presentation or any of our free CLEs, just visit legalfuel.com forward slash free CLE. And thank you again. And thanks. In case anybody was curious, that was um, a Lotus Elise uh, from our dealership that my husband made beautiful with my logo. So thanks to him for doing that. And everyone, you have a great day. Thank you, Daryl.